what I would actually take you across uh, through is uh, is the first we involved in the undescended testers, and then the algorithms how to go about uh, treating them. So, in a nutshell, this is a whole life. The testicle is a whole life in nutshell. So. Uh, we need to be careful about how we tackle this organ. So first and foremost part of the undescended test is, is the mechanisms of descent. Now, do we have any specific idea in terms of what are the primary causes of uh, the uh, mal descent of the test is? Lot of, uh, uh, there have been a lot of uh, uh, philosophies or a lot of uh, postulations which have been put in in terms of hormonal where there was a decrease in uh, LH and then a decrease uh, an increase in uh, sorry the decrease in MIS so a lot of things have been put forward but none has been actually proven or uh, linked specifically etiologically for the testicular mal descent then came the simpler gubernacular uh, theory then the genital femoral nerve, uh, they said that this genital femoral nerve acts as a, a important stimulant for the descent of the testis. They also said the intra-abdominal pressures um, do the, uh, create the descent. Then the relative growth of the body, the whole rationale came here when, because most of the children who have a maldescended testis uh, with lower fertility rates are significantly born small for gestational age. And then there was a, also a postulation saying that, that the spermatic vessels would not lengthen uh, the Y chromosome, the enabin. So a lot of things have been said in terms of testicular descent, but none of it has been proven that this is the primary etiology for mal descent. Now there have been a lot of endocrine uh, uh, tests, uh, uh, evaluations, sorry, the endocrine uh, investigations which have been done in terms of trying to find out the etiological cause. People have looked at gonadotropins, people have looked at androgens, they have looked at decrease in the LH, and then also the lack of the LH surge in mini puberty in the first two months of life. They also looked at diet or testosterone, they looked at MIS, and also the testicular tissue volume. As if the tissue volume is smaller, uh, there is a very significant increase in the undescended testis. So then came a bigger uh, thing in terms of environmental factors. So there are a lot of environmental factors, including the endocrine disruptors. Now these come from, where do these environmental factors come from? They come from pesticides. They come from plastics. So uh, they are being uh, attributed uh, from the plastics, you get biphenols, bisphenols, and then they are attributed to testicular dysgenesis and also decrease in Leydig cell function uh, androgen insufficiency, hypospadias, um, testicular mal descent. They also have looked at uh, decrease in uh, the fertility rates and they're also incre increased in anogenital distance. So environmental factors do play a role, but there is no definite evidence that they are the primary disruptors in the testicular mal descent. So what happens to these children who have testicular mal descent as far as the fertility is concerned? In a unilateral extra-abdominal testis, the fertility is almost the same as a normal uh, child. In a unilateral intra-abdominal testis, the fertility rates are less, but the paternity rates are normal. That means the fertility rates, the amount of num number of ad spermatogonia and the sperms are less, but ultimately, when they look at the percentage of paternity rates uh, to children who had uh, both the uh, descend, both descended testes, uh, their paternity rates are normal. If there is bilateral intra-abdominal testes, both the fertility and paternity rates are low. And if the bilateral extra-abdominal, again, it turns out like a unilateral intra-abdominal testes. So what happens uh, to these testes? If it's an in, ipsilateral, intra-abdominal, and palpable, uh, what happens to the contralateral descended testis uh, in terms of fertility? And you can, can see in this graph that the number of germ cells per tubular cross-section compared to that of the normal testis 
actually are much lower in children who had an ipsilateral intra-abdominal testis. And this is more so in uh, children uh, who are born for uh, small for gestational age. So there are changes in a contralateral descended testis in case of an ipsilateral intra-abdominal uh, testis. Now, they also looked at uh, the uh, hormonal evaluation and they said that the patients with low basal LH value and then where the LH does not go up in the, initial, in the mini puberty, there is a significant uh, rate of uh, decrease in fertility in these particular children. And there's been no correlation between the inhibin values and the FSH over a period of time. Now, let us look at retractile testes. The philosophy of retractile testis, as uh, we looked at, was that if the testis is retractile, that means if you can bring the testis down to the base of scrotum, then it is called a retractile testis. And these retractile testis would not need surgery, and probably you can uh, not, you may not need to follow up these testis, but evidence proves it otherwise. About 10% of retractile testis requires surgery. They need to be followed till they descend. Now, what is the age limit? At 12 years, if it doesn't descend by 12 years, they need to be fixed. And if the retractile testis does not stay in the scrotum after examination and ascends to the superficial ring, and these are the children who may really need orthopexy. So we need to take care of these children and then uh, follow them up very carefully. If there is an uh, associated hernia or a patent process vaginalis, the ascending testis is a reality. So these testis can ascend even into an intra-abdominal position uh, when the child starts growing. And the volume of a retractile testis, uh, which is above the scrotum, uh, which is uh, is lower than the scrotal retractile testis. That means if a testis can be pulled down at the scrotum and stays in the scrotum, the volume is almost the normal as a normal testis. But if it does not and if it ascends, these are the testes whose volumes are definitely lower compared to the normal testes. Now, what's the acquired cryptarchidism? You have to first document that the child had a normal, the normally descended bilateral testes. And they should be documented they have been in the scrotal sac. They should be differentiated from the retractile because these have these are normally descended testes. This is more common in children born in small for gestational age, which can be about 24%. That means in a child who has been born uh, preterm, you can have about 19 to 24% of these children when they grow, the testis probably ascends into the groin or into the abdomen. And a family history of uh, undescended testis is an independent risk factor. The adspermatogonia and germ cells are significantly decreased in these particular type of testes. So if you look at acquired cryptarchidism, and then if you see the number of uh, hernias in the test is almost about 40 hernias, 140 of these out of a uh, total of two, two, uh, 289 had hernias. And it could be unilateral or bilateral, so about uh, one thirds of uh, unilateral and uh, sorry, two thirds are unilateral, one thirds are bilateral. So the presence of hernia makes it a very important uh, point that these testes can ascend. So we all look at that if a testis is in the intraabdominal position or not in the scrotum, we all know that this testis has a higher risk of malignancy. So the relative risk of a testicular cancer is around 20 to 46 times. And if it is an intra-abdominal testis, and 1% of these would have ITGC, which is the older terminology, now we call it uh, CIS. And the uh, relative risk in a contralateral descended testis is about one, uh, is about, uh, one to two, that means more than twice a contralateral descended testis can have a tumor. Uh, if there is a unilateral undescended testis. The location may not affect the uh, pathological type because 80% of these are seminomas. But if the uh, testis is fixed early, 30% would be seminomas, 30 would be embryonal tumors, and then uh, it's a equal, almost an equal distribution, post-occupancy. 
Does orthopexy decrease the risk of malignancy if it is done pre-pubertal? Yes, probably 2.2 by 2.35. If not done pre-pubertal, the risk still is quite significantly higher. The risk of malignant degeneration of the remnants is uh, high in terms of street gonads, but if there is a nubbin uh, or a blind ending vessels, these testes rarely become uh, malignant because they only about two to three percent of these testes would harbor uh, any kind of uh, germ cells. So the nubbins can be left uh, inside without much of uh, a risk. So to summarize, the history and clinical examination in this in children are extremely important. You need to look at the ipsilateral and the contralateral size. Now, the contralateral size is important if the uh, contralateral descended testis has got a bigger uh, or a larger size. So, we know that the opposite side testis is smaller for age and smaller in size. We need to look for ectopic areas. We need to, if there is a bilateral testis and if there is also an anomaly of the urethra or the penis, we need to look at karyotyping. We need to look at HCG testing, imaging in very specific cases. But for us, an imaging of an ultrasound is generally done, uh, but a negative ultrasound would not change our uh, plan of management, but a positive ultrasound would give us some lead to go ahead. And the other thing is it will also probably give us an another uh, an overview of the anomalies. So the management needs to start at around six months because now it rarely descends after this age. Most of the treatments have to be completed by 12 months. The EAU says the latest by 18 months, but the recommendation now is to complete the management by around the surgical management by 12 months. Medical therapy, the success rate is around 20% and is not recommended. There's no difference between a daily or alternate day dosages of uh, HCG. And fewer lower dose injections for five weeks seems superior, but definitely not uh, statistically significant. It's, uh, a few papers have told us that the hormonal treatment may improve fertility status by increasing the number of spermatogonia. Not sure. Testicular biopsy may prognosticate the fertility potential in bilateral cases. Offer orchiectomy with normal contralateral testes in post pubertal children. Fertility in unilateral UDT is lower, but not the paternity rate. And then in bilateral cases, it is severely impaired. So it's of note that the ultrasound, though providing interesting information, would not influence the therapeutical pathway, as I said earlier, that it only gives us that uh, the congenital anomalies may not be isolated. So we look at the congenital anomalies of the kidneys, the ureters, the bladder, and then with the presence of Mullerian structures. So that uh, the ultrasound helps. And in, in, and in India, ultrasound is much easier to access and it's quite reasonably cheap. So there is nothing wrong in getting an uh, ultrasound done. So uh, let me get to the algorithm. So how do we go about? So if you have an undescended testis, whether it's unilateral or bilateral, first is look at whether it's palpable or non-palpable. If it is palpable, look at whether it is inguinal, ectopic, or retractile. If it is non-palpable, again, look at whether the testis is in the inguinal region, ectopic, non-palpable, or intra-abdominal, or is it is absent. Now, this can be done only by, by a diagnostic laparoscopy. Uh, ultrasound would not give us anything on this particular uh, thing. Then if it is absent, it could be either agenesis, or it could be vanishing testis. So the unilateral non-palpable testis, the most important thing is re-examine your anesthesia. If palpable, go ahead, do a stand, uh, standard orchiopexy. Non-palpable, look at uh, whatever you want to do. It's a, a diagnostic laparoscopy versus inguinal exploration is still agreeable, but a diagnostic laparoscopy would actually give you the vasculature and the presence of testis. Subsequently, you can continue doing a laparoscopic orchiopexy, single stage or two stage, or you probably can actually shift over and then do a open orthopexy. The testis is close to the internal ring. Go ahead and do an inguinal laparoscopic or inguinal orthopexy. Too high for orthopexy. Stage follows Stephens. How do you decide if the testis is sitting on the uh, iliac vessels 
or there is very small mesentery and if you can't pull the testis across to the opposite side this is a very, very not a very effective method but make sure that the mesentery is small and it is sitting on the inguinal uh, sorry in the uh, in, in on the iliac vessels this is a case for uh, stage uh, testis blind ending, ending spermatic vessels it's a vanishing testis you need no further steps you need not uh, explore the inguinal region there are significant number of times about 30 percent you can see a nubbin but they won't uh, there is no increase in risk of malignancy and if the spermatic vessels are entering the inguinal ring you can do an inguinal exploration or you can still continue uh, laparoscopically where you can look at uh, through the lap, uh, into the inguinal ring and then identify the testes okay thank you very much